Welcome to my session on saving lives with stories. I don't know if you have heard the story about how HBI got started, but basically in 1996, there was a call from a PAMSA that students should do something about hepatitis B. Michael Tran was a first year medical student at Harvard, and I was a first year public health student at Harvard. And uh, we decided to partner together to answer this call. And neither of us ever imagined that HBI would still be running today, 24 years and going. Um, there are PAMSA students that continue to volunteer with HBI, uh, especially at George Washington University. That chapter um, does a lot with HBI. This is Emmeline Ha doing a um, abstract uh, analyzing the data that we've collected over many, many years. And she also invited HBI to host a screening vaccination event, as well as um, invited me to speak. So in case you don't know kind of what we've accomplished over the years, um, this is just in 2019, we provided public health education and screening events for individuals from 78 different countries of origin. We offer not only hepatitis B, but also C, HIV, BMI, glucose, and cholesterol screenings. Um, and the reason why we do this is because this approach takes away the stigma and of hepatitis B or C. And so when folks come in, um, that's kind of their out, their way of telling other people, I'm just getting my glucose or my cholesterol, and we say, um, well, I'm sorry, but it's part of the package. We have to do Hep B and C. Um, HIV is an option they can opt out of. And um, right now, in this screen, I'm just showing you the results for Hep B. Um, over 33,000. And we didn't really keep our data that um, organized in the early years. So this is safely from 2006 to 2020. That's how many people we've educated. We screened 21,000 people for Hep B, 21,000 for Hep C. And because we are bringing services directly to places where hard to reach participants gather, such as health fairs, community events, religious gatherings, um, the rates for you know who needs to be vaccinated and who is tested positive is very different. So for example, an event at GW University would be much lower than an, a, than a rate at a church, a Korean church, for example. So I'm giving you just the highest rate, just to give you an example of the most effective um, events. 48%, that was one of the highest numbers we've seen needed to be vaccinated for Hep B. And 13% tested positive. Um, and we also track how we get them into care. Uh, we do have a mobile unit as well that drives around. And during COVID, uh, we have a hybrid screening going on. So you basically you go onto our website and you fill out the forms and then we send you a voucher, which you take to a lab of your choice. And then there's a telehealth, um, basically a, a nurse from HBI will call you and give you results. So the takeaways that I wanted to give you from this, from this, um, talk is to to kind of tell you the story that I told in order to start this inspire this project and then um, you'll get a taste of the photos and and the story that I'll tell and that's and then I'm going to compare that to some of the studies out there about how narrative stories are so effective in changing behaviors or reducing health disparities. And then finally, I'll read an excerpt from my memoir so you get an idea of what I think is the most effective way to motivate folks to get screened and vaccinated for stigmatized diseases like hepatitis B. This is a photo of my mother. So she uh, was a, a very fun mother to have. She um, loved us as ferociously as she tried to get us in trouble. She believed that life was short and you had to seize the day. 
So we were always doing something adventurous outside, fishing, hiking, horseback riding. Um, we had a chance to visit almost all of the national parks in the United States and Canada before um, I went to college. She was an artist, a photographer, a journalist, and this is one of my, one of her favorite pictures actually of my brother and I in Channel Islands National Park. Here, this photo captures how she told us to slow down our heartbeats and listen to the things that people usually ignore, such as the symphony created by grass and wind. She showed us how art stories and photos can say things that people are afraid to say, how it can deliver a message long after the life of its creator. This was one of my favorite photos that she took of my father and I. Um, they, they said that I took my sweet time in coming. They tried for six years to have children. And my mom said I waited till they had a house and a car before deciding to join the family. 19 months later, my brother was born with his umbilical cord wrapped around his neck. He was short of oxygen for 15 minutes and couldn't breathe on his own for the first two years of his life. Mama said the doctors called John John a miracle baby because he had a severe case of highly membrane disease, which should have ended his life or damaged vital organs like his brain, but somehow Despite doctors repeatedly warning my parents to prepare funeral arrangements, my brother survived. My mom said that he was a fighter. <laughs> the first time we met, he basically would, he was so uh, angry and upset he would spit into the oxygen mask at everyone who came by, except when my mother picked me up and showed um, my brother to me and said this is your jeje and from that point on um she said he calmed down smiled for the first time and i mean i think he knew that his life um time on on earth would be short so he much to my annoyance did not mind broadcasting to the whole world that he adored me in high school he would show up at my door before the bell rang to and for dismissal and everybody would be laughing at me saying my brother was outside waiting for me but he didn't care and he really um, enjoyed being sort of the older sibling um he took care of me like you know leaving little notes beside my bed before i went before um, he went to bed telling me what the weather would be like so i knew how to dress for the day um anyway when i was uh Freshman in college, I received a phone call in the middle of the night. It was my brother and he was having severe abdominal pain. My parents were on a vacation for the first time without the kids. So, you know, he refused to give me their phone number. Sometimes I wish I listened to my brother and did not make that call because when I read through my mother's journals from when my brother was born until the end of, end of her life, I realized that Reno was the Oh, that's where she went. Um, that, that that trip was the first time she ever took a breather from being a mom. And that call would put her on a first flight back. Um, and the nightmare began of all uh, doctor visits, doing a biopsy, learning that my brother had a huge tumor, a liver cancer caused by hepatitis B. They would test the whole family and discover that she also had hepatitis B and that my father and I uh, were exposed to have B at one point in time, but we developed our own immunity. So instead of worrying about whether she could get liver cancer too, she obsessed about how we were exposed to hepatitis B. Was it the blood transfusions she got in Taiwan where they use the same needles on all the children? Um, well, and then once she discovered that hepatitis B could be passed from mother to child during birth, she spent the rest of her life thinking she had killed my brother. Um, over the next year, he had a very successful liver transplant, but at that time they didn't know that that was not a good a, option for treatment. And he um, immediately the the new the cancer metastasized the new liver and the lungs, 
and he, um, the doctor sort of like sent him home um, before he turned, it was right before his 18th birthday. And my parents nursed him back to health. He had a, a wonderful birthday party at our house with all the popular kids at his school. Um, and then he had a brain hemorrhage and died. And I never got a chance to say bye to him. A week after his death, my mother was diagnosed with liver cancer as well. And although we fought her cancer with alternative therapies, I lost her the following year. My mother died before my 21st birthday. My father sold everything that reminded him of my mother and brother and replaced them with a new wife and son. That was kind of the way he grieved. It was all about mianzi, which means saving face in Chinese. Um, he wanted to just kind of pretend nothing bad had happened and to move on. Um, and my relatives expected me to do the same thing. They didn't want me to show any weakness. Um, and I disappointed them all by doing just the opposite. So I gave up medical school and decided to go into public health. I swore I would never have kids or get married. I told my mother, I mean, I told myself that, you know, my mom, and my brother couldn't have died for no reason. So I had to do something huge. I had to save the world or, you know, basically I wanted their death to make the world a better place. So I founded HBI with Michael Tran in 1997, a few months after I started my studies at Harvard. And my vision was really to bring together public health and medical students toward a common goal of addressing the high incidence of hepatitis B. It also became my Schweitzer Fellowship Project. Um, and we were able to, to uh, recruit students from across the whole Boston area. So we had um, medical public health students from Tufts, Boston University, Brandeis, Brown, Cornell, MIT, and Wellesley. And we not only offered free hepatitis B screenings and vaccinations, but we also created a model for harnessing the energy of students uh, and their ability to facilitate partnerships between community organizations that might have bad blood. Um, medical students got to screen and actually vaccinate patients. Um, we had a clinic of our own at Sherwood, at, called Sherwood at Tufts, and the medical students ran their own clinic. We learned how to find funding. Medical students got to practice bedside manners, patient care, and then public health students, at the same time, we were doing coursework on, you know, how do you do a mass media campaign, how do you create cultural and distinctly appropriate campaigns? And we were able to um, basically use HBI as our, as our project that we did for our class assignments. Um, and so sometimes we had to create a survey or community needs assessment um, or a case study about conflict negotiation, those type of things, which came in really handy. January 1998 was when we launched uh, the campaign. We thought, you know, partnering with South Cove Community Center, we would tell people to come every other Saturday between 1 to 4.30, and can't read that, and uh, have, tell them that's when they could come and get their screenings and vaccinations. Uh, the Boston Globe and a bunch of Asian newspapers and radio stations interviewed me and shared my story and told their readers to drop by South Cove for the screenings every other Saturday. When I graduated, I passed on HBI to Harvard Medical Students for several years before it became an undergraduate run organization. During all those years, I realized that my story not only inspired the participants to get screened and vaccinated, but they also inspired the leadership. Um, this was one of my favorite quotes that I got from one of the um, executive directors of HBI that came along after me, and he was a Harvard medical student, and he said, your story has been very inspiring for me, and I will take it to my heart and my studies to become a doctor and to learn from the many lessons you've been able to share. I had another uh, doctor, uh, John Sue, who, um, who was able to also uh, apply for the Albert Schweitzer Fellowship and make HBI his project. 
and he actually went on to found a Schweitzer chapter in, um, I believe, UCLA. And he said the value of HBI was, was innumerable. Um, prime among them was balancing different priorities in my life. For most medical and grad students, it's just school, but that wasn't satisfying to me. To be giving back, to learn about public health as a medical student, to interact with other like-minded, idealistic students challenged and invigorated me. It wasn't easy, stressful quite often, but I think it prepared me for residency. In my career now, balancing being a residency program director, um, he's running Albert Schweitzer Fellowship at his, his university, and helping start a medical school, um, and being an okay dad and husband. So let me just briefly give you the timeline. Um, I just wanted to show you, kind of summarize what I was, I've been talking about. So 1996 was the founding of HBI. It was run primarily by students. And then in 2002, right before I met my husband, we were both um, inspired to found an affiliate of HBI in the DC area. And this turned into HPI DC. That's the one that received the 501 3C in 2007. And Jane Pan became the executive director in 2009. And she is um, fundamental in, in bringing this organization, you know, to the level that it is now. She's still running it. Um, as I mentioned, um, every year she creates this report. Uh, I've only included the 2019 numbers for you, but as you can see, um, they did 75 events in that year, providing in-person education to 3,146 individuals. They, as a result, over 70 individuals were linked to care and or treatment services. All right, um, one thing I should mention is, is uh, the different, because we learned from Boston that telling people to come to a health center every other Saturday wasn't actually the most effective way. That's kind of when we came up with the idea of delivering services directly to places where um, the hard to reach population gathers. So like churches, fairs, um, ELA. <laughs> and um, so we got like double the numbers that we saw within several years at the Boston. I'm also on the HBI's advisory board, and sometimes I'm called to speak at HBI events. Uh, but what I like to do now is just ask you, what did you connect with in the story I've told you so far? Any values, images, or words? And if you're listening to this recording, uh, not live, then I'd love for you to email me and tell me what kind of stood out for you? Okay, so now I want to kind of go over some of the studies. There actually are quite a number of, of research studies that talk about how narrative based stories, stories that have a beginning, a middle and end that show conflict and resolution can be very effective in reducing health disparities. This study using written narratives in public health practice, a creative writing perspective. This one was done in 2014 and they, this is a good one to look at if you want an idea of the elements that you need in a story. But they basically talk about how any cohesive and coherent story with an identifiable identifiable beginning, middle, and end that provides information about scene, characters, and conflict, raises unanswered questions or unresolved conflict, and provides resolution. Public health interventions may use fictional stories, authentic stories, or composite stories. Narrative interventions in various media have been used to promote health behaviors such as controlling hypertension, quitting smoking, receiving mammograms, and preventing screen cancer. And they've also found that uh, it's especially effective um, with uh, hard to reach populations and reducing health disparities. The, study, uh, the same study also said narratives are useful 
for health communication, according, but incorporating them into public health practice requires skills that may be new to public health professionals. The transdisciplinary approach of using techniques from creative writing helps practitioners use stories effectively to prevent chronic disease. So in case you didn't know, uh, after you know, my time uh, getting my master's in public health, I actually went on to get a master's in creative writing. And that's because ultimately I just felt like I wasn't reaching enough people. I mean, it would be pretty difficult to show my slides and my photos and my tell my story to, you know, a wider audience without actually, you know, having that audience be at my events. So that's kind of why I came up with the idea of writing the memoir. Okay, so another study, this one was April 2019, um, said we found that manipulated similarity can expand the persuasive power of a narrative, be it for a specific participant, groups, and similarity manipulations, particularly age similarity is found to be important for young people. So basically they found out that, you know, if they have a character that's the same age as the person they're trying to reach, um, it's very powerful form of persuasion. And I think that's kind of what worked for HPI is I was about the age of um, all these, uh, of the population we were trying to reach. And um, another story, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, another study in 2015 said this research underscores the need to ensure that persuasive narratives are relevant to the lives of their intended audience, because if not, they will fail. Our findings further suggest that different aspects of narrative messages should be manipulated depending on the specific beliefs and behaviors being targeted for change. By conducting formative research with the intended audience, researchers can develop a narrative to be highly relevant. Finally, our results also caution that particular attention needs to be paid to positive, negative, and transitional role models because identifying with particular characters can produce long-lasting effects that may differ from shorter term effects. These are critical considerations for the development of health messages in general, but they become even more critical when addressing sensitive topics such as cervical cancer and I would add hepatitis B. Okay, so what I'm gonna do now is to read an um, uh, excerpt from my prologue and chapter one and chapter five, just to give you a taste of my memoir. And then I'm going to ask you the same question, kind of like what images stood out for you. Um, this is kind of the summary of the whole story. At 20, I had white rider rafted, spelunked, hiked, and ridden on a horseback through nearly all the national parks in the United States when both my mother and 18-year-old brother died from the same disease. Alienated by my father's cultural beliefs to save face, move on, and pretend nothing bad happened, I turned to the natural world and indigenous people most intimate to these places for answers. Fireweed, a memoir, is a story about making sense of this messy world when you lose everything that made sense. It's about finding a place or home to anchor yourself and your descendants to, even if it doesn't belong to you. So it basically covers the years following my, mom, my mother and my brother's death and kind of how, how um, I was able to heal from loss. Okay, so I've included um, the excerpts just in case um, uh, you're not able to hear me. But it's always good to also just kind of listen to the writer saying the story. So anyway, I'm giving you both formats. Sometimes people like reading text better than listening. The summer I turned nine, our family got caught in a flash storm on the Wyoming side of Yellowstone National Park. Thunder and lightning lit up the skies while rain seemed determined to wash us out from under a skinny lodgepole pine. My father held D.D., my little brother, protectively in his arms. D.D. was 19 months younger than me. He was known at Duke University as a miracle baby due to a birth complication he was not supposed to have survived. Baba, I tugged on my father's jacket. His attention was focused on my mother. Mama stood in the middle of the trail, exposed to the elements beckoning for me to join her. Her hood was down, flapping in the wind like a cape. Her naturally wavy black hair, always kept short, licked the back of her neck like flames. Behind her, wisps of white smoke escaped from ephemeral. Baba shifted his weight. He was not a fan of Mama's annual National Park trips, 
which had started when I was four in DD2. While Mama took us hunting for unnamed caves, Baba usually run, waited in the car and complained. Makes no sense. Why go somewhere with bad Chinese restaurants and get eaten by mosquitoes? Lightning ripped across the sky, closer and closer, as if it was homing in on me. I panicked. Xiao Qing, do you know the name of this trail? asked Mama. She only used my Chinese name, Little Fragrant Glass, when she wanted me to pay attention. She pulled her camera from her jacket and studied me through the lens. Before I could say anything, Mama answered her own question. Artists paint pots, I wailed louder. Her smile always made me feel like no matter how messed up life seemed, she knew exactly how to fix it. Once she had tucked her camera away, Mama threw her arms into the storm. She closed her eyes, leaned back, and tried to catch it all on her tongue. The more the three of us struggled, the more my mother seemed to relax into a landscape. Look, she pointed at the gray sky, undulating like liquid silver. It's beautiful. I thought she was beautiful. Okay, now this is a little piece of how chapter one starts. On the shore of Trout Lake in Montana's Glacier National Park, rain sorted the ends of my hair into rivulets. The evening's chill ran down my spine and spidered its way to my toes. I planted my feet the way Mama did in Yellowstone, but felt the earth give way. More than one month had passed since Mama's funeral, and I still saw her face caked with makeup she would have never worn, stripped of what her college friends once described as Xiao La Zhao. I ordered her casket shut before anyone else could see what I will never be able to unsee. Mama died at the age of 50 to the same disease that claimed my 18-year-old brother one year earlier, liver cancer caused by hepatitis B. As soon as we buried Mama, Baba sold our house, purged everything that reminded him of Mama, and Didi and moved closer to his job. Then he joined a Chinese dating service. My relatives expected me to do the same. Don't wash your dirty linens in public. Tell others only about the good things happening in your life. When someone says, how are you? Respond fine, especially if things are not because of mianzi, saving face a complex social currency deeply embedded in the Asian culture that has to do with saving face or bringing honor to the family or how we want to be perceived by others. As an American born Chinese, I rebelled against a concept that did not value Western ideas of integrity and objective truth. How could I pretend that I didn't lose my mother and brother within three years? How can I lie and say I'm fine when mama died two weeks before I turned 21? Instead of accepting my boyfriend's offer to take me to my first bar and taste my first Long Island iced tea, I locked myself in mama's closet where beneath the drape of her dresses and coats that retained her comforting smell, I mulled over my future. Their death had raised the stakes. I felt obligated to accomplish something significant enough to make their deaths worth it. I felt obligated, okay, I'm sorry. As soon as we buried Mama, I said goodbye to Baba and my boyfriend on a train platform and begged them to understand that in order to heal, I needed this job working at the front desk of Lake Madonna Lodge at Glacier National Park. Among the nearly 50 national parks in the United States and Canada, we explored together every summer before Mama and John John died. Glacier topped our favorites. Superman had his fortress of solitude to hide from the world. Glacier was mine. Okay, now this is a little piece from chapter five. This is the only time that I kind of do go into a flashback and actually show the deaths of um, my mother and my brother. On March 2nd, 1993, I was studying in the dorm room for my final exams. Two months earlier, his doctors told him he had two weeks to live. They gave up on him, said there was nothing more they could do. Mama and Baba brought him home. Our whole church prayed for him. He got stronger each day. On February 12th, he turned 18 and nearly 50 of his classmates, the whole football team, all the cheerleaders, and just about anyone that was popular in high school that used to make fun of him showed up at our doorstep. Though I tried to quit school several times during his illness, my parents and my brother insisted 
that they needed at least one person in the family to continue with their life as if none of this was happening. I couldn't concentrate on my exams, so I called Dee Dee. M, my brother answered the phone. M was short for Michelangelo, the Ninja Turtle, an inside joke that began in high school when a boy called me a Ninja Turtle. Hey, how did you know it was me? I know, he said. How's my bro doing? I could hear his loud, raspy breathing. Are you surrounded by your flies, he asked. Dee Dee called my guy friends flies because of the way they buzzed around me. We teased each other for a while in our own language. Bro, can I come home? I'm worried about you. No, he said in a tone that meant the discussion was over. He was silent for a moment. I could tell he was getting angry. Mama grabbed the phone. Les, you know this is important to your brother. She reminded me about how he liked acting like my big brother. Making sure he wasn't listening, she whispered into the phone. Remember shortly after we found out cancer metastasized to his new liver, you had to take your car in for maintenance? Even though he wasn't feeling well, he phoned the mechanic ahead of time and told them what you needed. We both choked up. He wants to feel like one of our lives is not affected by cancer. I didn't say what I really wanted to say, that my life had already changed. It would never remain the same. Mama changed the subject. She had arranged for a Chinese physician at Sloan Kittering who had had success treating liver cancer with the reishi mushroom to treat DD remotely. In Chinese legends, this large dry woody mushroom was believed to be a gift from God. The mushroom of immortality. It has antioxidants, anti-inflammatory, antibacteria, antiviral, anti-tumor properties that also stimulates liver cell growth, prevents cirrhosis, enhances liver detoxification, and even reduces hepatitis viral world. Research shows, studies prove that this mushroom can kill cancer cells. Mama told me about the weekly lab work she'd ordered to monitor Gigi's progress on the herb. She draws blood from his Broviac line. He stopped silicone catheter surgically placed into his central vein that prevented him from having to receive IVs through repeated needle pricks in his arms and wrists. And then Baba would drive the blood sample about an hour away to Cedar Sinai. She would then call the lab, get the results of the phone, and relay them to the Chinese physician. Mama said, the lab technician or doctor that calls me is always so rude. They snap at me and say, everything is fine. When I ask them for the exact numbers, they say they are too busy. Finally, we went to buy a fax machine today because this lab technician promised that if I have a fax machine, they can fax me the exact numbers. Dee Dee picked up a different phone in the house and gave me the news report of what was happening around the world. He talked about the floods, houses sliding in the mud, the shout out, the shootout in Waco County, Texas. Mama laughed and said, all right, I'll let you two do your thing. Leslie, don't keep him on the phone too long. After some more banter, I started to worry about my exam early the next morning, and I said, hey, bro, I have to go. I love you. Hi, he said to annoy me. Mom wants you in bed. Hi. Bye, bro. Hi. Bye. Hi. Okay, this is for real. I love you. Talk to you tomorrow. Hi, I got to study. Bye, I said. I hung up at the phone, not knowing that it would be the last words I'd ever say to Dee Dee. All right, so same question. Looks like it got got kind of dark here while I was reading while I was uh, recording this. <laughs> um, what did you connect with? Tell me, send me an email and let me know what images and words and values stood out for you. And I'd love to compare, I mean, if you could compare your list that you made between listening to the memoir and the photos and the story I told just telling, um, you, could, you could probably see a big difference. Um, the telling version, you know, it did, I tried to put in a little bit of scene, uh, some of the sensory details, but definitely couldn't do that as much as I could in the memoir. Um, so anyway, I will leave you here with my contact information. I really appreciate um, having you join me today. 
and I thank Apenza and Melinda for inviting me. Um, and I really do hope to hear from all of you. Um, the, the memoir, Fireweed, I am still working on it, about to turn it into my agent, and I hope to, um, I hope it gets out there. I hope it, it can reach a wide audience. I hope it gets published and, and that you'll be able to read it someday. All right, thank you. Nice to meet you all. Bye.